this is, we're, we're not, you know, the goal here is to do a real life training. I'm not going to start with a bunch of fancy talk words. We're just going to go into training about evacuation. We're live now? I should have drank water before we went live. <laughs> All right, I'm Brian with HVAC School. And I'm Sal with uh, Products by Pros, and thank you guys for joining us today for this evacuation practice training brought to you by Brian Orwell with the HVAC School. Um, I do want to mention that this uh, training is sponsored by Johnstone Supply Wear Group. Um, and I ask you guys to stick around for the training because at the end we're going to have a special prize for you guys to be able to get your own uh, evacuation kit or true blue host kit from AccuTools um, to use, which we'll be demoing in the training itself. Yeah, so big thanks to AccuTools and Johnstone for making this possible. Some of the, you know, we're going to be doing some demonstrations where we're going to be using AccuTools uh, tools, but you can use other brands as well. Um, so this training is not just AccuTools specific. Correct. Um, but AccuTools makes some excellent, uh, excellent products that do a really good job with this, and they're actually the products that I use at Kalos. So we're talking about evacuation, which is uh, an increasingly popular topic. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty thankful for that in the HVAC community. We're finally catching on to how important it actually is. And I think it's important for me to note right off the top, for anybody who starts to watch this, um, there's, a, there's always going to be a cohort of technicians who think that this is overkill, what I'm about to talk about. But what they don't realize is that a lot has changed in our industry over the last few years. We've got POE oil was probably the biggest factor. Mm -hmm. POE oil is highly hygroscopic, which means that it absorbs moisture. And when it absorbs moisture, it changes into like an acid via hydrolysis. So quick mic check. Are we? And when it absorbs moisture, it changes acid via It's not, it's, oh, it's not live on YouTube right now? Yeah. I can, I can hear it on YouTube. No, we'll give it a second. It's not, it's, oh, it's not live on YouTube right now? Yeah. I can, I can hear it on YouTube. No, we'll give it a second. No, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's live on YouTube. Yeah, it's live on YouTube. Yeah, it's live Okay, we got it. Okay, good. good. All right. Whenever you're doing a live stream, you always have to have it. You always got to double check. So, that's live. Um... Yeah, Maybe you're going to say nope. Okay, we got it. Okay, so good. Whatever you do in the live stream, highly hygroscopic. It's going to be changing. So that's live. Um, okay, we got it. Okay, good. Whatever you do in the live stream, actually turns into an acid, which when I first uh, started working with POE oil, when Fortune A first came out, sort of in around 2002, 2003, we started seeing a lot of it. And we had all sorts of compressors that were blowing out black oil all over the place. And what we realized was is that the installers at the company I was working for, they were running line sets underneath underground chases, and they were getting water into the line sets. And so I realized, kind of trial by fire, that we had a major moisture problem and that it was impacting POE oil, specifically what we used with 410A, uh, much more than it was when we had mineral oil, which is what we used back in the R22 day. So um, the challenge is getting bigger nowadays. Um, there's a lot of things that improper evacuation cause on a system. It causes copper plating on compressors, which is a, uh, a major problem. You get copper plating where you, it actually leaches copper out of the system and then it deposits it on the bearing surfaces inside the compressor. And a lot of guys will say, well, hey, look, I've been doing vacuum the same way for the last 25 years and it's worked just fine. But the reality is you don't know if that compressor failure that happened six, seven years down the right. road was due to improper evacuation or not. You've got no way of knowing. So there's a lot of reasons we want to pull good vacuums for the equipment, for our customers. But if we're going to pull vacuums and we start using things like micron gauges and vacuum gauges, we quickly find out that there's a lot of challenges um, that you didn't have when you were just pulling the 30-minute vacuum, a couple smokes and go, pulling it through your, through your manifold. And so a lot of technicians get frustrated and they give up on it. But I'm going to show you today how you can do it effectively, quickly, and make evacuation uh, trials something of the past. Can I ask a really question easy. on that? So duct-free systems, I've heard an emphasis on pulling a vacuum for yep. duct-free systems. Why is it specifically emphasized on duct-free a little bit more than I've heard in the industry for unitary So, systems? yeah, so ductless systems, um, they use uh, either POE or PVE oil, polyvinyl ether oil, um, which has that same hygroscopic properties. But in duct-free systems, you have these very, very small screens and very small orifices. And so any sort of contaminants are going to be a bigger problem with those types of systems. And so, again, with ductless, duct-free, you really want to keep not only moisture and air out of the system, which we're going to talk about, but you also want to keep any solid contaminants out, which is why a lot of them use flare fittings, because technicians aren't good about flowing nitrogen. So there's a lot of different factors. Keeping things clean, dry, clean, dry and tight is more important than it's ever been. 
Before I go into the science of vacuum, which we're going to go through here, I want to be really clear, though. Using fancy tools uh, is, is great. I mean, these are great products. Um, using great processes is important, but common sense practices are the biggest thing that you can do in order to come up with a good result. So things like not getting dirt in your copper lines. When you're reaming your copper, don't mm -hmm. let shavings fall inside the copper tubing. Make sure to keep everything capped until the moment that you're ready to use it. Flow nitrogen while you're brazing. All these sorts of things that you don't think of as being directly related to evacuation can result in uh, problems that show up in the system later. Right. And so uh, while we're going to talk about these practices here, I want to be really clear that common sense approach is always the best way to go. If it's raining, you don't leave the tubing open, you know, <laughs> really obvious stuff common like that. Common sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Pulling, I've seen guys pulling clean evaporator coils where they pull the evaporator coil out, they take it in the yard and they start hosing it off and they never cap the copper lines, you know. So obviously, um, common sense rules supreme here. All right, so one thing that, uh, so first off, I got to give credit where credit's due. This presentation was created by Jim Bergman. I think Jim might actually be watching this right now, so thank you for making this, Jim. Um, and Jim is really good at kind of giving credit where credit's due. Um, the stuff that we're about to talk about today is not new information at all. This has been around, uh, you can see here, Review of Vacuum for Service Engineers. That was written in the 1960s, and we're going to reference that quite a bit. This is not new knowledge. This is stuff that we've known forever, but we've gone away from it in our trade for whatever reasons. It's sort of lost knowledge. And so um, Dan Hollihan, he's been on the podcast. Um, he's kind of a steam guy, but he has the quote. Um, he talks about the dead men, the, the people who created these uh, documents that were, have been referenced in the industry forever, but we get away from. Um, it's the long gone authors that have taught, taught us the lost arts. So we want to go back to the basics here. This is not what I'm about to talk to you about is not new. It's not fancy. It's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward, but it's just how it works. All right, so let's go over the basics. <clears throat> First thing, vacuum pumps don't suck. So a lot of people think of a vacuum pump as creating a vacuum, sucking on something. Vacuum is still pressure. It's still the movement of pressure from high to low. We talk about this all the time in air conditioning. Uh, hot goes to cold, high pressure goes to low pressure, high voltage goes to low voltage, mm -hmm. right? So you go from a high energy state to a low energy state. We are not really sucking in the way that we think about it. What we're doing is we're creating a low pressure area and then high pressure is pushing in. And that high pressure comes from our atmosphere. So at sea level, we have about 14.7, actually slightly less than that, but about 14.7 PSIA, 14.7 PSI that's pushing down at, on us at an all side. So you can think of it like we're sitting at the bottom of an of a ocean of air. Mm -hmm. and so all this air is stacked on top of us. And so when we're pulling a vacuum, all we're really doing is we're just removing molecules. We're creating a low pressure um, situation so that way we can get that stuff out of the system. But it's still pressure from high to low. It's not, it's not what, the way we think of it when we think of like a vacuum or something like that. But even, even a vacuum, if I'm, if I'm cleaning the floor, it's actually atmosphere pushing in and moving the dirt into your right. vacuum, not really sucking in the way that we think of it. We're creating a low pressure zone and then that air is rushing in. So that's what we're trying to do with a vacuum pump. Now, there's a lot of different ways of measuring pressure. We're going to talk about this a little bit, but our atmosphere and the earth is really is really held in by gravity. So we have all of this, uh, again, this ocean of air that sits on top of our heads and presses down on us on all angles. And really all we're trying to do is we're just trying to remove that atmosphere from inside the system. And atmosphere, when I say atmosphere, it's, it's air. A lot of people think of air as being oxygen, but oxygen is just one constituent component of air. Most of air is actually made of nitrogen. Uh, but there's a couple things in air that we do not want inside of our air conditioner. Right. Number one is... Moisture. Moisture is number oxygen. one. Good job. You like I just put you in a spot there. No. Yeah. Moisture is number one, and number two is oh. oxygen. So moisture and oxygen are two things that we do not want in the system in air because oxygen creates oxides. Uh, it, all kinds of nasty stuff happens inside the system when oxygen is present. You can have with flammable refrigerants. You could potentially even have explosions in the presence of oxygen, and we don't want moisture because moisture yeah. causes all kinds of problems as well, like we talked about with POE oil, corrosion, all sorts of nastiness. So. We're trying to get all of that out of the system so that way we can replace it with refrigerant so that all, mostly, all that's in that system, you can never get all of it out, but mostly what's in that system is refrigerant rather than air and specifically moisture and oxygen. Nitrogen is also not good because it's a non-condensable gas, but of what's in the air, nitrogen is the one we're the least concerned about. And it does make up most of the air. All right. 
I'm going to skip past this real quick. All right, so one thing um, to remember is that gases have molecular velocity. They're bouncing around all over the place. Um, unlike a solid, where in a solid, there's molecules you know, in this coil here. It's made of solid aluminum. But those molecules are just vibrating in place. They're not bouncing around. In air and in uh, liquid, those molecules are constantly moving. And so what we're doing when we create this negative pressure with a vacuum pump is we're kind of guiding those molecules out of that system. However, the total volume of molecules in the system remains the same because no matter how many molecules are in there, the mass changes. As I, as I pull stuff out, the weight of mm -hmm. the air inside the system changes, but all the molecules that are left still fill up the entire space. Right. And so that's where that pressure just keeps dropping. Right. But we still require a pressure differential in order to make them move. And that's why when you're pulling with a vacuum, initially, they start to come out really fast. And the term that we use for that is, is laminar flow. They move out really straight and kind of fast. And then later on, they start to, there's fewer and fewer of them, the pressure difference is less, and they start to move out very slowly, which is something you'll notice when you pull a vacuum. You'll get those, you know, you'll get down pretty quick at first, but then it really starts to slow down as you get into lower and lower pressure, which is all vacuum is. Vacuum is just low pressure. It isn't sucking like we And there's a about. specific pressure that you get that laminar, laminar flow at? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I, I'm not going to talk about the, the really deep science of evacuation because, you know, technicians don't care about it. But initially, especially when you're up in, you know, above 2,000 micron range, it's it, mostly what you're taking out is air. And then when you get down to those lower levels, now you actually start boiling off more moisture okay. and now you have less laminar flow. So the molecules are bouncing around a little more. They're a little more erratic. And that's a lot of what we face in the field from a very practical standpoint, what we run into is we notice that we can get down to a certain level, but then beyond that, it becomes really, really tough. Okay. And today, what we're going to talk about is how you can really pull a deep vacuum quickly, because again, you're going to have greater pressure differentials. You're going to, you're going to maximize the pressure differential you do have, uh, I should say, because the pressure that we have to work with is 14.7 PSIA. That's all we've got to work with, because that's all the atmosphere gives us. All right. So. This is actually a cool slide here. So bring this up full screen, Austin. I really like this one because we don't typically look at vacuum gauge sensors. And I'm going to actually move over here. And uh, in case some of you don't know what a vacuum gauge or a micron gauge is, because I don't want to make any assumptions, I'm moving over here to Sean's camera so you can switch to this real quick. So this is a blue vac micron gauge is what we call it, but it's a vacuum gauge. And inside this vacuum gauge, is that little thermistor sensor. And that's how it measures really, really low pressure. That's really what a micron gauge is doing, is it's measuring really, really fine pressures. When you say a micron, what you're saying is a millionth of a meter of mercury column. So it's a tiny, tiny measurement of pressure. It's a millionth of a meter of mercury column. And so how it does it, let me switch back to full screen on that slide, how it does it is what we're showing here. It uses this tiny, tiny little bead thermistor sensor. And a thermistor sensor, all, all a thermistor sensor is, is it's just, uh, it's run, it runs a current through it and that thing heats up, that little sensor heats up to about 300 degrees and it monitors how much current is required in order to keep that thing at 300 degrees. Vacuum is a poor conductor of heat. So if you think about the vacuum of space, you know, that's something when Jim does his presentation, he talks a lot about that. Space is essentially a vacuum. There are very few molecules bouncing around, and so space is also an insulator. There's an you know, insulating factor there because heat isn't transferred easily in space. And so when you pull a really deep vacuum inside of a system, when you get the atmosphere out, it actually insulates that, uh, that thermistor. And so the thermistor requires less current in order to heat up. When there's more atmosphere in there, the atmosphere, air, conducts heat away from it, mm -hmm. and you're going to measure a higher vacuum because it knows at that point that uh, it's requiring more current in order to, in order to keep that uh, thermistor sensor at the same temperature. The point being that thermistor sensors, they're tiny, they are very, very accurate, and they're designed for measuring tiny, tiny pressures, but it's doing it through thermal conductivity. Something to know, and we'll talk about this uh, further in a little bit here, is that these are calibrated for air. They're calibrated for nitrogen and air. They're not calibrated for refrigerant. So when you get really weird readings on a micron gauge, it starts bouncing around on you and acting funky. It's often because it's being exposed to a little bit of refrigerant or something else other than air or nitrogen. So nitrogen, because air is made up of so much nitrogen, the sensor is going to function the same in air or nitrogen. They're very, very close to the same. 
but as soon as the little puff of refrigerant passes by it, so say you have some refrigerant that boils out of a compressor, and it's, it's entrained in the oil, uh, now all of a sudden that micron gauge is going to go crazy on you because it's calibrated uh, with its thermal conductivity for air. So I'm sure we'll get into it, but I'm assuming that's pretty uh, a sensitive item in there, that sensor. So It is, you know, but it's interesting, though. Um, they can get dirty, but they're actually, th if you were to jar them around, they could be damaged, um, but they're not as sensitive as you would think they are. They're actually a little hardier um, than a lot of people think, especially with cleaning and things like that. Oh, hold on. Any questions yet, Austin, from the audience? While I'm, oh boy, I was downloading it from YouTube. Do you know if it's been chosen from measure kits that have, that are at annual retail, or is it going to go transfer into a plant and convert into a plant that's working at capacity? Right. That's exactly what I said, measure quick. <laughs> No, so yes, it's 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 looking at current basically, and it's converting that, yeah, yeah, based on based on thermal conductivity. All right, so this is a uh, in this little video here, it shows, and we're not gonna we're not gonna play it right now on screen, but just have it up in the corner, Austin. Um, basically, how a vacuum pump pumps is it's a it's a rotary, it's a, basically a rotary compressor of sorts, and so it's trapping in uh, molecules as they go in the low pressure side, and then it's discharging them out. The outgoing side. It's very similar to a rotary compressor in that way. So ductless systems often have rotary compressors. Very, very similar design. It has little veins that spring in and out. Uh, but it traps that gas as it comes in. Um, some of that moisture tends to get trapped in your oil, and you'll see that if you have excessive moisture where your oil will actually become creamy or cloudy, which is an indication of uh, a lot of moisture in the system, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But um, the goal for this pump itself, if you just were to isolate the pump, I like to see the pump get down below 50 microns just by itself. So that tells you that the oil is doing its job, that the pump is working, that oil actually acts as a seal as that pump mm -hmm. rotates around. And so if you don't have the right amount of oil in it, you're not going to get the performance. If the pump is damaged because of contaminants getting in it, you're not going to get the performance. And if that oil is dirty uh, because it has moisture or other contaminants in it, which affects the vapor pressure of the oil, then right. that's going to cause you not to Which is your limiting be, factor, right? That so. becomes your limiting factor. Exactly. Exactly. So. We've got a couple different things that we're looking at here, but everybody focuses on the pumps. Everybody wants to talk about, well, how big is, how, how, what's the CFM of your pump, right? But very rarely is the pump your limiting factor um, in what we're trying to accomplish in residential. Now, in commercial, in some cases, that can be the case um, where, where you're not, you know, it's not pulling down as quickly as you'd like to put a bigger pump on it with the large hoses and it will pull down quickly. But generally speaking, as long as you have a modern pump that has got nice clean oil in it, you test it, make sure that it pulls down. Um, you know, even you know, two, three, four, five, six CFM pumps are generally going to do the job for us in, in residential. But it is creating a pressure difference. That's a key thing to know. All right, so vacuum hose is an extension of the system being evacuated. So when we have the, all the tubing in the system, and again, what we've got here today, and we're going to do a demonstration on this, but we've got an evaporator coil attached to a line set, and this is sort of replicating a typical uh, change out or new installation where you're not pulling on the condenser or the compressor, but you are pulling on the line set and the right. evaporator coil. So when we connect hoses, say to the suction line or whatever, um, the hoses become an extension of what we're pulling on. And so if the hoses are small, then that's going to be a limiting factor. There's going to be a pressure drop right. across those hoses. And really what we're trying to do, um, the term that Jim always uses, because it's the right term, is uh, conductance, which is how much stuff can we get out of the system? I mean, that's the point. We're trying to get atmosphere out. We're limited by that 14.7 PSIA that the atmosphere is pushing down on us on all sides. That's all we have to work with is 14.7 PSIA. There's no way to jack up the pressure on a vacuum pump. You know, we've only got atmospheric pressure. So the way to get more stuff out is to have less pressure drop, to have minimal resistance so we get maximum conductance speed, which just means the speed at which the stuff is moving out of the system. Right. Do you have anything to add there? Exactly. No, I mean, the, the way I think about it, when you keep on going from high pressure, low pressure, and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically it's going to, it wants to get to equilibrium at the end of the day. Right, exactly. That's what it's trying to get. Everything to. wants to achieve equilibrium. That's true 
hot goes to cold, that's true high voltage goes to low voltage, that's true, you know, you roll a ball down a hill, right? You have this equilibrium in gravity, right? right? It wants to move down, it wants to seek its level, it wants to seek equilibrium. And so what we're doing with a pump is we're creating a differential. But the pump is only the start of the story. That's the originator of that differential. But everything that we add that's a restrictor down that line creates additional pressure right. drops. And what we found, and we're going to talk about this, is that the hose size is actually the biggest limiting factor in what most technicians are doing. So most of the challenges that we have, I'm kind of giving away the, <laughs> the ending here, but most of the challenges that we have in the field are related to the hose size being too small. Correct. Or too long, combination of different things, but pressure drops. All right, viscous flow. So the term viscous flow is uh, kind of that first part of the evacuation, that per first part of the vacuum where you're pulling out a lot of atmosphere. That's where you have that laminar flow where everything's mm -hmm. coming out pretty quickly. Um, this, this is actually from the uh, uh, Vacuum for Service Engineers 1959. I said 60s, so it was even before that. But if you look at the underlying part, put, the, put this uh, slide full screen, Austin. When you look at the underlying part, it says the conductance speed of quarter inch OD refrigeration tubing. Now we do ID, in, in, internal diameter. Oh, sorry, no. No, no, it's OD, it's refrigeration it. tubing, sorry. Um, so the conductance speed of quarter inch OD refrigeration tubing is too small to be useful as a connecting line to a system. We're talking about for vacuum purposes. So we will not even discuss it. Never use it if you can avoid it. And so what do we typically use? for our evacuations out in the field today, Sal. <laughs> charging hoses. Answer is charging hoses, quarter inch hoses, right? Yep. And it's not just, there's other challenges that we're gonna talk about with charging hoses, but that quarter inch hose size really, really limits your conductance speed. So, I mean, that's what we've got over here. I'm gonna just grab one so we know exactly what we're talking about. So this is our center hose that we're typically gonna use for charging, right? We're gonna hook it up to a refrigerant tank, and we're also gonna connect this to our vacuum pump. And so it's got to go through this hose, generally a six-foot hose is what most guys use, and then it's going to go to two quarter-inch hoses to the system. That's the typical way. Well, almost everything that we experience problematically with pulling vacuums is related to this. Not just the size of the hose, but also the, restriction, right? the restrictions inside of the core depressor, um, leaky O-rings, all sorts of different factors. The fact that this hose is probably contaminated with oil and moisture, from having you know, been left open in your truck. There's all these different factors. And so when we run into challenges where guys joke around that, oh, I can't pull 500 microns, that's not realistic. You know, It's because you're using these quarter inch hoses that were not designed for that purpose. Meaning the purpose of evacuation. All right, um, let's see here. So again, the handicap, this is, this is uh, down at the bottom of this slide here, um, where, it's, where you have this uh, highlight where it's squared out there. Um, it's, the handicap is the undersizing of the lines. The pumps are often not the problem. Again, it's a good practice when you first, before you start pulling a vacuum, test your pump completely isolated with a micron gauge. And we're gonna show that to make sure the pump's doing what it should do. It's got clean oil in it. But generally, the pump is not the limiting factor. Generally, it's the size of the hoses. All right, conductance speed, bigger is better. And so this kind of gives you a baseline to compare. I'm just doing some basic math here. Um, quarter inch hose at 1,000 microns because the conductance speed changes as you get lower pressure. Mm -hmm. As you get lower pressure, your pressure differential is also less. So we're using 1,000 microns. Um, I think this is 10 foot of hose is the standard that's being used here. Um, at 1,000 microns, you're gonna get 0.5 CFM through. So question, <clears throat> if you're using quarter inch hoses, what is the point of having a six CFM pump. There, there is you, no point, right? You this, wouldn't get the CFM. You might as well have a 0.5 CFM pump because the limiting factor is not the pump. The limiting factor is the pressure drop across right. those hoses and the conductance speed you're gonna get across them. You go to a 3H hose, which is commonly used. Um, a lot of technicians use that on a set of gauges. Well, now you're at one and a half CFMs. So you're still not getting the full benefit. You go to half inch hose, which is another, that's like the Mac Daddy standard, right? If you really were going for it. <laughs> Uh, 4 CFM. Now, if you go to a 3 quarter inch ID hose, like True Blue, now you're going to get 16 CFM. So now you can use the biggest pumps that we're typically going to have on our trucks, and you're going to get that full, um, that full use out of it. So this slide also shows the difference between that initial viscous and laminar flow. Transitional flow is a little slower, kind of in between the two. 
and then molecular flow is when you get down into those deeper vacuums. You have lower pressure difference, and those molecules are just kind of just bouncing around. You know, they're, they don't, they're not moving in a straight line anymore. So in essence, quarter inch and walking away for an hour and a half while my pump's running doesn't work. I mean, it, so again, it, it, it's not that you aren't moving anything, but you see the math here. Right. It's half a CFM. Right. So is it possible that you could, on a nice, dry, clean, typical install, pull a system down using just that setup? You could. But I'm also going to talk to you about why a lot of guys think they're pulling sub 500 micron vacuums when they're actually not at all. And we're going to show that on this rig here in a little okay. bit. There's a lot of techs, even once you use micron gauge, like, I don't have a problem. I just, uh, I'm doing other things anyway. I'm pulling it. It pulls right down. No problem. Well, in a lot of cases, you think you're pulling a deeper vacuum than you are. All right. So this just shows you the difference in size. So Refrigerant tube, refrigerant hoses aren't the best thing to use for, for vacuum. And we know this. This is not, again, this is not new fancy stuff. Uh, businesses that rely on pulling really deep vacuums consistently, like in industrial processes, they do not use uh, rubber hoses. They use hoses like True Blue. They use these large diameter vinyl type hoses that don't leak. They're not pinpricked. They're not designed for charging. They're designed specifically for evacuation. So that's the point that we're getting to here. Lots of reasons to not use quarter inch hoses. 3 16 ID, the out gases. Rubber actually has a, an off gassing to it. So um, as you put rubber under a vacuum, it's actually giving off some material, some VOCs, which affects the vacuum. Um, they have a rough interior surface, which creates more turbulence in mm -hmm. the flow, which creates more um, pressure drop. Uh, they have higher adhesion properties, which means that uh, moisture and oil and things like that are more likely to cling to the sides. And so it's more likely to hold that stuff in there. Um, easy to become refrigerant while contaminated. They're pin pricked, which means the outer jacket is actually has to be pin pricked. So that way they don't burst. Um, that's because they're designed for <laughs> pressure. Um, and they have high permeation, which means they leak. Um, quick news flash, because I think a lot of technicians think that they create these completely leak free systems. Every system leaks. The tightest system you've ever seen still leaks at the molecular level. Even things like silver solder joints have these little tiny micro fractures in them that can leak at the, at the molecular <laughs> level. So the idea that, well, I've, you know, my system doesn't leak or my hoses don't leak, everything leaks. It's just a matter of how much. And it shows up more in vacuum than it does under pressure typically because we're using a micron gauge right. if we're doing our job right. And a micron gauge is such a fine measure of pressure. It measures such tiny amounts of pressure. All right. I'm going a little slow here, so we're going to skip past some of this, some of this math. Now, some people will say, um, as I'm sure you've probably heard out there in the field, Sal, Sal talks to a lot of technicians. They'll say, well, what, why, does this, why does this giant hose make a difference, this three-quarter inch hose? Because I'm still attaching to quarter inch ports. So go ahead and bring this slide up full screen, Austin. Um, you can see here, think of it like a toll booth. Would it be better if a highway was all a toll booth width? Would that be better? Would, would, would traffic flow as well? Well, the answer is, of course not, right? It would, you would have almost no movement of, of traffic. Right. Um, pressure drops are cumulative, and so every there's pressure drops at every point. Yes, it would be better if we didn't have quarter-inch ports. That would be better, but still the hose itself is a greater limiting factor than the ports. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go watch the YouTube videos. There's like a bazillion of them where guys have tested this. Um, you do want to remove your cores. Removing your cores is going to help re increase your flow, and we're going to show you how to do that. Um, but the hose is still the primary limiting factor, and so there is a huge uh, advantage to using larger hoses. Um, a quarter-inch ports, uh, while they do restrict flow slightly, um, is not uh, the number one it's thing. It's just temporary. Yep. It's just one little point. All right, so... Basically what it comes down to, and we've already covered this, but this is the math to back it up. If you're a really mathy person, um, you know, pause it here and you can go through all this. But the point is, is that with quarter inch hoses, you don't move a lot of stuff out of the system and your vacuums take forever. With three quarter inch hoses, larger hoses, hoses that are designed specifically for evacuation, you're going to pull vacuums faster than you ever thought possible. And it's not just a matter of speed. Now time is money. So that's a factor, but you're also going to pull better vacuums than you ever did before. And that, to me, is actually the bigger thing. Now I'm going to go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and pause here real quick because I know there's some people watching this who have this thought in their head, which is just this really pervasive idea in our trade. 
Um, what's the what's one of the top questions that you get when you talk about pulling a really fast vacuum? You're gonna freeze the moisture. You're gonna freeze the moisture in the system, right? And this may be further on in this deck here, but I want to get to it quickly <laughs> before I lose people. Who are like, oh, this is bullcrap. You're gonna freeze the moisture system. Okay, that's not gonna happen as long as you're not pulling a vacuum at near freezing temperatures. Now, anytime you're pulling a vacuum at near freezing temperatures, you run the risk of freezing water in the system. Regardless right? of your hose size. Correct. Um, not to get too sciencey here, but there's this idea called triple point, which is a point at which uh, water can exist as a vapor, a solid, and a liquid all at the same time. And when you go below triple, triple point, you can actually pull a vacuum and freeze water. It's a, it's a thing that can happen, okay? But when you watch videos, people do it in glass containers, um, like well, if you want to grab that vacuum uh, chamber right there, um, <clears throat> this glass vacuum yeah, is right here. You know, I could I could effectively freeze water inside a, a glass container like this. The reason I can is because this is an insulator, right? It's this glass is designed to insulate, and so when I pull that vacuum, there's not going to be a lot of heat transfer through the walls, and so it can become ice. In a typical system. AC refrigeration system. Again, if you're near freezing temperatures, then of course you can freeze water. You don't even need a vacuum to freeze water if you're below freezing temperatures, right? I mean, that's obvious. But as long as you're above that, um, these coils and copper and all this, they're designed to conduct heat. That's their very purpose. Right. And so as you start to drop the temperature, as you're pulling that quick vacuum, heat is going to come in and do the work of boiling off that water. Now, is it still theoretically possible? I've had guys tell me, what if I had a window unit and it was absolutely full of water and all this stuff? Okay, it's theoretically possible, but even then, even if you do create ice in the system, that ice will still turn to vapor through sublimation. It acts like dry ice does. CO2, you know, where you have the solid and then it turns to vapor. Mm -hmm. um, it does the same thing inside the system if you continue to pull the deep vacuum. So the answer is there's no reason not to pull the deep vacuum and there's no reason not to pull it fast. Got it. Keep liquid water out of the system in the first place. So you shouldn't have, you know, a bunch of liquid water in the system to turn to ice in the first place. Um, but even if you do... There's still no reason it not to pull. It is by far the number one comment for most people. Yep. And so just, again, you know, don't knock it until you try it. Once you try it, you're going to find out that it saves you a bunch of time. And that ice thing that you've heard your whole career just doesn't really come up right. very often. It just doesn't come up, right? And if there is a problem, it's actually not ice. It's probably refrigerant coming out of the oil or something else, you know, or refrigerant interfering with the sensor on the micron gauge. All right, so what's the limiting factor in your speed? you got to think about this entire thing as a system. So you've got your copper lines, you've got your vacuum pump, mm -hmm. you've got your refrigerant hoses, you've got your ports, you've got your core depressors, you've got your actual cores inside of your ports. These are all limiting factors to flow, but you have to address all of them in order to get maximum flow. But again, the number one limiting factor, this is just another slide that says the same thing, the number one limiting factor that you run into is the size and the design of the hoses. Again, I, so just real quick, when I'm, when I'm doing these talks like this, I'm doing these trainings, um, it may sound like uh, maybe a little bit of a sales pitch, but I want to be really clear, we use these products in Kalos. Like, uh, that's where I am right now. I'm at my contracting business. We have 125 employees. We actually do this in the field. And to a person, the technicians who doubted me at first when I gave them these kits, they're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm doing other things anyway. Those guys would not even think about doing it any other way now after they've experienced how much better it is to, uh, to do it with the large, with the large hoses and, and eliminating all of your limiting factors. So again, here we go. This is showing, uh, this slide here is showing how much difference it makes using dedicated vacuum hoses and large gauge hoses. And there are other uh, products on the market um, that are good products, but they're made of rubber and they're a little smaller gauge and you're still not going to get quite as fast results as you would get with uh, True Blue specifically, um, which is the only dedicated evacuation hoses in the HVAC market currently. Um, there are plenty in you know, industrial evacuation, which is the whole uh, industrial vacuum, um, which is the whole point here. It's not like we're reinventing the wheel. We're going back to stuff that we knew in the 50s and 60s and just doing it better. All right, how big of a pump do you need? So this gets really practical. And these are actually three of my favorite products, depending on the, the type of uh, industry that you work in. So the Field Piece uh, vacuum pump is a really good pump. NAVAC makes a couple of cool pumps. Um, the NAVAC battery-powered pump is a uh, 2CFM pump, and it works great up to five tons. We've, uh, we've actually done it in the field where we've pulled vacuums in under five minutes to 300 microns and held using a battery-powered little pump. And Take that uh, for what you, you know, take what you want out of that. But the main thing that I want you to hear is, is that 
the pump is not generally your limiting factor. Right. When you're running into trouble pulling a deep vacuum and holding it, it's generally that your hoses are undersized or you're not pulling the cores. Those are the two biggest things that you, that you ought to be doing. Um, so if you're going, if you're going uh, up to 10 tons, and 5 CFM will be adequate. If you want to have a 7 or an 8, that's fine as well. Um, I, you know, the, the Field Peace VP85 is a great pump. If you're going to really, really big stuff, um, that's where this, you know, you got this 24 CFM uh, NAVMAC pump here. If you're doing chiller work or something like that, that might make sense. But again, you have to make, you, you have to have a lot of hose volume in order to make use of that additional capacity. So there's no point in putting a really big pump on small hoses. It's not going to benefit you at all. Right. Like, that's what I want you to hear. If you're using quarter inch hoses, it does not matter what pump you use. 0.5 CFM. 0.5 CFM. That's it. It doesn't matter what pump you use because the hoses are the limiting factor. All right, so again, tests have been done showing 12 CFM versus 2 CFM using a 12 CFM with the black hoses, big 3 8 hoses on a, re on a nice manifold. You know, those of you guys who have your four port manifolds and you're really proud of them, um, you would think, well, I'm going to put a 12 CFM pump on this sucker. I've got my nice big hose uh, attached to it, and it's definitely going to beat that 2 CFM with the blue hoses. And the answer is that it, it doesn't. It does initially but eventually the true blue hoses the large volume hoses beat it hands down as it gets lower on and that's what that curve is showing the blue one there is showing how far um how much after 15 minutes how much deeper the vacuum was which is pretty significant and again we want to get as much atmosphere out of that system as we possibly can a lot of guys will say another big myth is they'll say oh you're going to damage the oil <clears throat> you're not going to damage the oil okay just Get that out of your mind. Your vacuum pump is not going to pull a deep enough vacuum to damage your refrigerant oil. We've done tests on this. There's actually been um, Ulysses Palacios. He's a uh, a really big industrial. He's a he does he's an industrial tech on really big ammonia systems in Texas, and they've done oil tests, pulling them down to very very deep vacuums, and then sending them in for lab analysis. It does not damage the oil. There's I'm not sure why they used to say that, um, but especially maybe it was some additive in mineral oil that were, that caused an issue with, but um, you're just not seeing that today. So you want to pull a deep vacuum. So you, you, you get most of your speed right after the 2,000 microns. Is, is that where that? That's where the advantage comes in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's where you get, again, when you're in laminar flow, um, it comes out pretty quickly when the pressure differential is high. Um, it doesn't make as much of a difference, but when you're pulling that deep vacuum, when you're trying to get below that 500 microns and hold and really dehydrate the system, that's when it makes a huge, huge difference. Okay. And remember, <laughs> this is a 12 CFM pump against a 2 CFM pump. That's what this competition, this race is. And it's not, not a fair fight at all. And still the, the large diameter blue hoses Got did it. the job. All right. Again, you can see the difference in size of, of these two hoses. I mean, it's an enormous difference. All right, quick, uh, quick review of the pump ballast. Um, pump ballast helps you to keep the oil from getting contaminated. In the uh, in the above 2,000 kind of micron range. So, uh, what a lot of guys will say is, is leave it closed, go to 20,000, open it, go to 2,000. Most of you aren't going to be disciplined enough for that. So, if you know that you have any potential of a wet system, um, so maybe it's been in operation and had a leak in it or something like that, where you potentially could have gotten moisture into the system, that's where you're going to want to leave that gas ballast open until you get to 2,000 microns. That injects air into the second stage of the pump and helps to keep from contaminating the oil. Um, because, it, again, if you've ever seen that creamy, milky oil, as soon as it gets creamy and milky, well, now your pump's not going to pull down, and you're going to have to change the oil in order to get your ultimate vacuum. So this is those circumstances where you say maybe you have a really wet system and you want to leave it running a long time, maybe even overnight. There's still applications where you've got to do that, and it's right. not because of the limiting factor of the hoses. It's just because you've got to get the moisture out, right? So the hoses, these big hoses are going to do a much better job with that, but that's where you leave the gas ballast open, you leave the thing run overnight, once it gets below 2,000, you come back in the morning, you shut the gas ballast and let it finish the rest of the job. For a typical residential um, company that's doing a lot of change outs or installs, you're pretty much generally going to be able to leave that gas ballast closed because when you're pulling on copper and a coil, there's no reason that you should have significant moisture in there. So, okay. um, again, that's my opinion. The powers that be would say always open the gas ballast until you get down to 2,000, but I want you to understand where the line is there. I'm just going to do a quick time check to make sure we have enough time for the demonstration. Oh, we have enough time. Did we say it was an hour? No, we didn't say. Just most guys want to see the demo on here. Okay. And I'm taking too long? Is that nope. what you're saying? No. Are you getting cranky with me? No. Okay, we're good. 40 minutes in.
That was always pressuring me, you know? I'm Stuff. just making sure you're timely. Okay, good. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so, again, what this comes down to, this slide is just talking about dehydration and how you really have to get down into that low micron vacuum, that really deep vacuum. And again, at a deep vacuum, you have a low pressure difference. And so that's where the larger hoses, the less pressure drops become more critical. And it takes time for that to happen. It's still, there's still a time fa factor that is not uh, the fault of the, of the pump or of the hoses. It just takes a little bit for that to detach, for that moisture to separate itself. So if you've ever run into cases with a wet system, you know how long that can take. And it's because it's got to boil, it's got to boil off, it's got to detach, and then it gets uh, pulled through. All right, as temperature goes down, specific volume increases. Um, I think we're, these are some areas, we're getting a little mathy here, so we can skip by some of this. All right, so let's talk about the process for fast evacuation. And I'm not, I don't like to be a slide reader, but I think let's put this slide up full and we'll just go over these steps real quick just to make sure we don't miss anything. Keep the piping clean, dry, and capped. Like I said off the top, nothing is going to be a replacement for best practices of just keeping water out of it in the first place. Right? Right. And this is where the next step comes in, too, sweeping with nitrogen or CO2 before pressurizing. So before you ever even pressure test that system, you want to sweep nitrogen through in order to help displace as much of that moisture as possible to make it as dry as you can before you pressurize because the process of pressurizing can actually cause condensation of vapor in the system. So you wanna displace as much of that water vapor through sweeping first, then you're gonna pressure test. And pressure testing is not a step you can skip. A lot of guys will talk about, well, if I pull a really deep vacuum and I valve it off, I, can, I don't need a pressure test because my vacuum proves the pressure test. That is not a safe idea. And in fact, this little rig that I have set up here, this coil is leaking a tiny, tiny, tiny leak. And I can still pull this thing down to below 300 microns. Um, and, and it does decay, but it doesn't decay terribly fast because it's a small, tiny leak. And again, uh, when you're dealing with vacuum, vacuum is a very small pressure difference. And so even with a super sensitive gauge, like we have with a micron gauge, um, you have different types of leaks. And sometimes that leak will actually scab over under vacuum where you've got to do both, basically. Here's the point I'm coming to. You've got to pressure test and pressure test to the manufacturer recommended pressures. Um, and then do a bubble test, do a standing pressure test, uh, and make sure that you don't have any leaks before you start pulling a vacuum. Because okay. if you've got leaks, that's a, that's, you're gonna pull moisture into those leaks. All right, so once you get done pressure testing, you vent to about one PSI, so moisture can't enter into the system. So you want to not vent to atmospheric and leave the thing open after you're pressure tested. I've seen a lot of new guys do this, installers, they, okay, I get my pressure test is good, psh, and they walk away, and 10 minutes later they come back. Well, now, that whole time, you had a chance for atmosphere, moisture, oxygen to enter that system again. Now, you're going to pull it out with the vacuum, but the more you keep it out, the easier it's going to be to pull the vacuum. So just right. make it easy on yourself. Don't let it get in the first place. Start with clean, dry vacuum pump oil, and I would say start with clean, dry vacuum pump oil and test your pump. Isolate just your pump. And so that way you see what your pump pulls down to. Make sure it pulls down to below 50. That's kind of my standard. A lot of people say 100. But with modern pumps, there's no reason you shouldn't pull below 50 by itself. Because I'm saying literally just the pump and a micron gauge. And now you can uh, start performing a deep evacuation. Before you get to the next one, number six. Mm -hmm. What's this concept of triple evacuation requirements? All right, so triple evacuation, and I want to be clear. First off, I'm not telling you not to follow manufacturer guidelines. So if you're dealing with a ductless manufacturer who tells you to triple evac, I'm not telling you not to do what they say. But I want you to know why they tell you to do that. Okay. They tell you to do that because nobody, for, for decades, nobody's pulled proper vacuums. And so in the absence of a proper vacuum, it's better to get people to do a triple evac, especially when their pumps weren't working right, their hoses were too small, getting a, a deep single vacuum was largely just not happening. Mm -hmm. So the manufacturer said, do a triple evac, right? Now, because it's been so common for so long, people actually start to forget why it's even valuable. And let's just mention what it is. So you pull down to a certain level with your vacuum and you break it with nitrogen. You pull down a lower, lower, you break it with nitrogen, and then you pull down to a deep vacuum, right? There's a couple benefits to that that make you feel like it's doing a really good job. And one of them is, is that if refrigerant has been coming out of say a compressor or something, mm -hmm. um, sweeping with nitrogen, breaking it with nitrogen is gonna help kind of recalibrate your micron gauge because it doesn't recalibrate it, but what it does is, is it exposes the sensor to nitrogen rather than refrigerant again. 
And so when you have a micro engage that's acting janky on you, you may decide to do that just for that purpose. Um, but again, the whole benefit of triple evacuation where guys think that nitrogen absorbs moisture, nitrogen does not absorb moisture any more than air does or anything else, okay? It, it's, it's not a sponge for moisture. Now it can actually sweep some out if you have a lot. And so in super wet systems, there may be some value in it, but for a typical residential system, like for example, even carrier, Carrier does not specify that you've got a triple evac. They make it as an option if you have a bad pump. Basically, it tells you if your pump can't pull down to a low level, then you can triple evac, which kind of makes me laugh. Um, for most every application that we run into, a single deep vacuum is your best bet. It's time saving and it's going to do the job perfectly okay. fine. Perfect. If a manufacturer tells you to triple evac, I'm not telling you to not obey the rules, but just so you know, maybe you can have a conversation with them about, eh, maybe that's a little archaic now with the new technology. I mean, because with the hoses that they're using, you're saving a ton of time by doing it once. Exactly, right. exactly. Doing it once is going to save time. And again, we're sa saving time, money, and having better outcomes. That's the goal. All right, so pull to and hold below the target for thorough de dehydration. This is the part. There's a lot of guys out there who claim 500 micron vacuums. But where they're measuring it, is at the pump. So Sean, if you want to bring the camera over here and we'll switch to this real quick. So a lot of guys are doing some version of this where they will hook their micron gauge via a T or even, even worse, maybe pull through the micron gauge, the ones that have the through ports on them. And they're measuring microns. They're measuring pressure here at the pump. And so what they do is they wait until this gauge gets down to 500 and they say, thumbs up, awesome. It's working perfect, but it's not that simple. What we show and how we pull a vacuum is we actually pull on the suction line and we put the micron gauge all the way on the other side on the liquid line. And there is a vast difference in the level of vacuum at the pump versus the level of vacuum at the complete other side of the system. Yeah, I've been on a couple of jobs and every single one of the guys either have it on their vacuum pump or have it on the uh, suction line itself. Yeah, again, so um, there are applications where you want to use both hoses and go to both ports, especially when you're pulling on the whole system. So you're pulling on the compressor, um, you're trying to pull, you know, a, on a big system, something like that. Um, but for typical residential change outs, we're just pulling with one hose on the suction line and we're putting the micron gauge on the complete other side on the liquid line. And that gives us a really good speed and a simple setup where I'm not using gauges, I'm not pulling through a manifold at all, so that's another thing. Don't use manifolds, pull your cores, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then by having the micron gauge on the other side of the system, I know for a fact that I'm getting that deep vacuum all the way on the other side. Because okay. the idea that while that pump's running, that the vacuum is the same everywhere is just completely false. The vacuum is gonna be much deeper, you're gonna have much lower pressure at the pump than you have on the other side of right. the system. Right. And that's where a lot of guys go wrong, where they say, hey, I pull a half an hour vacuum and it does fine. Okay, where are you putting your micron gauge? That's question number one. And question number two is, are you valving off and doing a vacuum decay test? Now, BlueVac makes this really easy where they have these charts so you can actually watch the decay on a mobile app. Uh, but regardless of what type of micron gauge you're using, you really need to valve off using a core tool. So we always use a core tool on the suction line. We'll go over this step by step. But we use a, sorry, yeah, core, core tool on the suction line. Um, and then we valve it off once we're at the point where we think we're where we need to be. And we make sure that we're not decaying too quickly on the complete other side of the system. I see. And decaying just means that the pressure is raising. And when that pressure raises, it can be one of two reasons. It can be due to um, moisture still in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it can be due, due to even refrigerant coming out of the oil. That's another one. Um, but that would be generally on the higher, kind of higher side of it. But then another one, common one is leaks. System has small leaks, you're going to see more decay. Now, to be clear, every system decays. So like carrier standard that they had back in the day was to pull to 500 microns and that it shouldn't go above 1,000 microns. I think it was 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. Um, what we do at Kalos is we pull below 500 microns and we want to make sure it doesn't decay to above 500 microns in 15 minutes. Got it. So that makes sure that you have a really nice tight system. Now, if your leak is like an EVAP coil leak, a formicary leak, you may have a tiny, tiny, tiny leak that doesn't show up under vacuum at all because vacuum is a low pressure. So that does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that there are no leaks when you do that. It's just the best procedure that you can follow to make sure that you don't have moisture and that you are leak free. But do manufacturers point. specify the decay for each of their No, they, I mean, so not all manufacturers do. You know, Carrier has that spec, but not all manufacturers do. If you're doing commercial work, a lot of times there will be specs for that um, about how far you have to pull down and the decay rates, like on chillers, that sort of thing. Um, there's a video 
where uh, AK Greaves did one with Jim Bergman on a giant chiller, and they had a spec. Um, so, again, follow manufacturer specs, but it's okay if you beat the specs. It's okay if you go lower, right. hold longer, stay deeper. That makes sure that you're doing a really good job. Now, it also says here you can document via screenshot um, for your report. Um, high vacuum pump oil. Um, again, use good quality vacuum pump oil. That's all this comes down to. Uh, most of the uh, name brands that you recognize out there that make vacuum pumps also make pump oil. My experience has been that... Uh, that they'll pull down nice and deep. Um, some pumps that I have, like some of these NAVAC pumps, will pull down to as low as five microns um, by themselves, isolated with a good, nice, clean oil change. And again, the deeper the pump will pull, that's really important. So it's not just the CFM of the pump, it's what is the ultimate vacuum that it can pull. But having uh, nice, clean oil that's got a proper vapor pressure on it so that it's not gonna, uh, you know, it's not gonna actually, uh, again, what happens is, uh, the way, let me describe this. What happens is when oil gets contaminated, and you pull down to a deep vacuum, what's in the oil will actually start to essentially off-gas, or it'll start to come out of the oil. And what that results in is not being able to pull down the properly deep vacuum. So having nice, clean vacuum pump oil where it's just vacuum pump oil is really what you're looking for. All right, so the next limiting factor is pulling those cores. Put this up full screen, Austin, for me. Pulling cores is a really big uh, factor. So if you see this picture here, you can see what the, it looks like with a core in versus a core out. Um, in many cases, we're relying on a core depressor in, on, in our hoses. When we're using quarter-inch hoses in order to push in, it's like a little tire pin. And the internal volume of that little pin is tiny. Um, the actual opening size is just tiny, tiny, tiny. We okay, Austin? Yeah. Probably an hour. Okay. We just lost the file. That's okay. We can just, if you, if you want, you can just go to this camera and we can show it as we go. All right. So get the, get the cores pulled. Um, use a core remover tool. A lot of core remover tools were originally designed for pulling and replacing cores under pressure um, for systems that had damaged cores. But what we found is for recovery and evacuation, pulling the cores, leaving that core remover on while you're doing your evacuation is huge. But you want to use a core remover tool that was designed to hold under vacuum. There's a couple brands out there that are specifically designed for that, where they've got the double O-ring design, and mm -hmm. they're really going to hold under vacuum. Some of them just don't hold up under vacuum. Is there a good way to check that? There's a, yeah, th there's a couple good ways. One kind of neat thing you can do is you can sort of hold your finger over the end of it, and then you can pull out on the, on the core tool, and you can feel a vacuum on your finger, which just proves that, you know, I'll, I'll show it over here. We'll, we'll go to this. So if you hold your finger over the end and you kind of pull out, you can hear that popping noise because it's actually holding that vacuum in the core tool. So that's a, kind of a quick and dirty way to prove that it's at least holding under those, under those uh, low pressures. If you have one that's not holding even under that little bit of pulling it out, then it's definitely not going to hold under a deep vacuum. Um, again, it's just showing the quality of the seals. So get the cores out. Recoveries and evacuations, it's really good to get the cores out. Um, you also want to use dedicated vacuum hoses for the best, fastest results rather than charging hoses. So this is why we use this kit. Um, this kit comes with dedicated evacuation vacuum hoses, and not only that, it's sealed, so that way it keeps air and moisture away from the hoses without having to individually cap all of the ends, mm -hmm. which is a really nice thing. You can put all this stuff in here, and you know that moisture and air is not going to get to it um, versus using typical hoses. Another thing is a lot of guys will say, well, I just, use my, I just use my compound gauge. I use my suction gauge in order to measure vacuum. No, you cannot measure vacuum with your suction gauge. Measuring vacuum with your suction gauge is like trying to uh, you know, measure a piece of lumber to cut it with the uh, odometer on your car. I mean, it just doesn't, just doesn't work. You know, the scale is just way, way, way too large. It's not going to tell you. So I remember the old timer I worked with, great guy, but he would tell me, hey, just make sure that sucker pegs down at 30. Well, 30 doesn't even exist. You know, 30 isn't even a real measurement. Um, you know, it stops before that. So uh, you do not know whether or not you're pulling a proper vacuum. Again, here it shows uh, 29.14 is 20,000 microns and 29.916 20, uh, is 100 microns. I mean, you cannot see that with the naked eye on a regular gauge. And not only that, your gauge just isn't that accurate in the first place. All right, so you want, uh, you want vacuum gauges that have one-tenth of a micron of resolution. Um, you want to see uh, what the, you, you want uh, gauges that can, you can easily see where you're at and as well as your decay rate. You know, are you going up, are you going down, and your decay makes it nice and easy. 
that, that uh, resolution is really important. And uh, you want something that's going to have high accuracy. It's going to hold up under pressure because, again, in a lot of cases, when you're using core remover tools and you're pulling on a new system, you're going to have to have a micron gauge that can hold up to the pressure of the system when you release the charge. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some micron gauges aren't designed to, to hold up against system pressure, and they can actually become damaged. Um, all the blue vat gauges are, are really industrial quality. <clears throat> Make sure that when you're attaching your micron gauge, you're not doing it with rubber hoses. If you see um, uh, up here in this, pr in this presentation, um, you've got your, uh, actually, let me see if I have a, do you have a laser? Ah, we'll figure, we'll get a laser pointer. But anyway, a lot of guys are attaching micron gauges to the pump using rubber hoses or to the system using rubber hoses. But when you do that, your gauge, you know, the hoses are permeable, so your gauge isn't going to read actually what you have on the system. So you want to use a brass non-permeable connector like the one shown here. Actually, let me uh, let me show you what it looks like. So there's a lot of different uh, a lot of different manufacturers make these, but this is a brass. You, you got this shot, Austin? Yeah. Okay. All right. So so this is a brass connector. This is what you want to use to connect your micron gauge, and you want to connect this to the system, either on the side port of your core remover tool. So this is what a lot of a lot of people will do when they're using two separate large gauge hoses. They'll connect here, and then they'll connect the micron gauge like this. Do you see that? Okay. They'll connect it like this. Or if you're connecting to the other side of the system, so you say you're pulling on the suction line, you're connecting all on the other side, then you would just connect it like this, and you'd connect this to the liquid line. Now again, if you're going to connect to a Schrader, you have to make sure that you use the core depressor side on the Schrader. And this is sort of a notorious point and vacuum that can sometimes not make great contact. So you always want to make sure that you're getting really good contact that is nice and snug and depressing that Schrader if you are connecting a micron gauge to something that has a Schrader still in it. All right. You getting antsy, Sal? No, I'm always antsy. Yeah, a little jumpy. All right. So this here shows a picture of how to connect to the system and how you connect to the system is directly. You don't connect through gauges. You connect um, to the largest size ports you can get access to. So if you're connecting to a big chiller or something and you have larger ports, that's what you want to connect to. You want to have minimum uh, restrictions. You want to have minimum leak points. And so it's literally vacuum pump to big hoses to the unit. The micron gauge is what tells you when you hit your target, so you don't need gauges for that. And you use your core remover tools to isolate. Okay. Very simple. All right, so we've already talked a little bit about triple evacuation. We talked a little bit about um, water vapor, air nitrogen. Do not hold water vapor. It's separate from air nitrogen. Um, how low should you go? This is actually pretty important. So in comfort cooling, um, typical what we do day in and day out, um, trying to get a brand new installation, try to get it between 100 and 200, and don't let it decay above 500. Like I said, that's how we do it at Kalos. If the system's been in operation, it's going to be a little more difficult to pull it deep. And so that's where uh, pull it down to 250 to 500 and decay 1,000 microns max. Um, when you get into refrigeration, now you're back to the 100 to 200. And if you're ultra low temp, you want to pull even lower because it's more likely that you, you know, you're know you going to have issues related to moisture. Any moisture in that system can uh, cause some real problems in ultra low temp. Can I vaporize or damage the compressor oil by pulling it too low? Answer is nope, you can't. So don't worry about it. Isolate the vacuum rig for the decay test. And that's where we use some sort of a valve, generally the valve, the, the ball valve on the side of the core river tool, so that once you've pulled down where you want to pull down to, close that valve in order to make sure that you're not rising too quickly. You will almost always rise a little bit if you give it enough time. Um, it's not that, because again, all systems leak a little bit. Um, we're just making sure that they don't leak too much. And that's what we've already talked about. You can tell when a system um, has a leak because it's going to continue to rise in the decay test. It's just going to keep going up and up and up. If it's moisture, then it's going to tail off. It's going to decay to the to boiling point of the moisture, and then it's going to start tailing off. So that's also a good way for you to know whether or not you can use these decay tests. And the uh, the free BlueVac app made by MeasureQuick um, will, will allow you to see this right on the app if you have the BlueVac Pro Micron Gauge. And then with the, uh, you, can, you can document a job well done by creating reports directly from the BlueVac app. You can do screenshots, um, make sure that you know that you have a 
really good final result. Again, I've got to thank uh, Jim Bergman for giving us access to this presentation. It's a really good presentation. Um, but now we're going to quickly do a demonstration of how you actually do this in the field. Sounds good. All right. So, Sean, if you want to come on up here. All right. So, <clears throat> we've got a NAVAC pump here with the uh, digital micron gauge on it. And I'm just going to show you first off that test that we do with just the pump. And again, because microns are such a fine measurement, you're never going to get two micron gauges that, ag that agree exactly. Now, if you use two blue vac gauges, you'd probably get closer than, uh, than other brands, but you're still, it's going to be very rare that they measure exactly, so don't worry too much about that. But we're going to turn this on and show how quickly this pulls down if you want to get close up here so you can see this. So you can see we're already down well below 50 microns, which is what kind of my standard for whether or not a pump's going to do the job. And you can see here that the blue vac is showing 30 microns. This is showing 15, so they're within 15 microns of one another. But both are well below 50 microns. And you would keep the ballast closed when you do this? Test? Again, when you're doing this, yes, you, you just keep it closed. Again, the only purpose of the ballast, is you open the ballast when you suspect that you have a contaminated system, which okay. contaminated system. All right, so now we're just going to shut this off. Now, when we talked about the vacuum pump oil, this is our vacuum pump oil. This looks nice and clean. If this were creamy or looked dirty, then I would want to re replace it regardless. Um, a lot of guys say replace it after every uh, vacuum. And again, it just depends on how contaminated the systems are you're pulling on. If you're doing residential change out style uh, evacuations, you can do quite a few uh, vacuums before you need to change the oil. We don't want to waste uh, oil. That's not good for anybody. So, um, uh, so, but if you're keeping things nice, clean, dry, and tight, uh, you can get quite a few uses out of a single um, uh, s single oil change. But the big thing is test it in that way. Now you're going to you're going to watch this slowly go up, and that's just because there's a very small internal volume here. But again, this is not where we want to put our micron gauge for the actual test. So I'm going to show you how we do it at Kalos. Remember, this is signifying a line set and an evaporator coil on a new install. This coil has a tiny leak in it. I mean, it is a tiny, tiny leak. We tested it under pressure, and I'm using this just because, uh, of course, we don't have non-leaking coils, and I don't want to waste non-leaking coils for these demonstrations. So frugal, fr frugality is important, Sal. Um, so here's it. You just connect the large hose to the largest port on your pump. And then I've got my core remover tool here on this side of the, on the suction side here. I'm going to open it up. I've already got the core out of it, and you can actually see that here. It's just sitting here on my core remover tool. So I've removed the core from the suction side. I'm actually going to leave the core in the liquid side, and I'm using a core depressor. Um, AccuTools makes these really nice core depressors here, so I can valve it on or off as I, as I see fit. And now I'm going to connect the hose here to the suction side. So I don't have any gauges in the system. I'm just pulling large hose to large suction line. We've got a little bit of a limiting factor here, but it's not huge. And then we're going to take this and connect it to the opposite side of the system. So we're going to show the difference in vacuum. We saw that these were within 15 microns of each other. So we're going to show the difference in vacuum at the pump versus vacuum all the way at the other side of the system. So we're going to Connect that there. We're going to depress our core. So this signifies like maybe a typical two and a half ton, three ton system, something like that, and about how long um, it's going to take to pull on that. So right now, we've got our big hose here. See how quickly we're coming down, it's pulling through here. We still have the limiting factors in place of the um, of the actual Schraders themselves, the quarter inch Schraders. Did you have, did, were you That's just in sleep mode. I oh. don't know if you want to change it. Yeah, it hasn't it hasn't started pulling down yet. There it goes. So now you can see we're at a we're at a thousand microns, under a thousand microns here, and we're still at the other side of the system. We're at five thousand. But those of you who are used to using quarter inch hoses, so again, this signifies a typical change out. You would never see this thing come down this quickly. Now again, another thing is this evaporator coil is leaking, and this evaporator coil has been in service previously, which means it has a coating of oil on the inside of it. Um, so there's a couple different factors here that make this slower than what it would normally be. But here's what I want you to see over here. At the pump, we're at 250 microns, under 250 microns already. How many technicians out there would say we're good to go now? 
a lot of them, right? But if you look over here, we're still at 1500 microns all the way at the other side of the system. So we're pulling all the way from one side to the other. We want to get this side here to about that level. We want to get this side here to about 200 microns. Now again, it's going to take us a, a little bit longer because of the, some of the factors that I have with this evaporator flow. But you can see how deep it is at the pump itself. And we confirmed that this pump pulls well. We put both micron gauges together so we can compare them. They were within 15, but already we're below 1,000 microns on completely the other side of the system. When we're done and we want to do our decay test, which I'll just sort of short circuit here for the sake of time, literally all you do is you just valve off this core remover tool on the side and you just watch this here. Now, because it was at lower pressure on the other side, this is actually going to continue to drop. Even though it's valved off and we're no longer pulling vacuum, it's going to continue to drop. Go ahead, Austin. Yeah, uh, uh, Measure Quick wanted to add, for your information, there will always be a pressure difference between the uh, gauge and the pump until the flow completely stops. Right. Yeah, there will always be, there will always be a, there will always be a difference. Um, and again, those were both being measured at essentially the exact same, the exact same point. But now that we have it valved off, now it, it pulled down and it stopped, and now we can actually see it decaying. 799, 800, 801, 802, 803. And we know this is a leaking evaporator coil. We, we know that because I've already tested it. But if I were to watch the decay test on this, this would not pass the decay test. So we would know that we have a leaking uh, system. But if we open it back up again, we'll watch it come back down. So even in, an, in a less than ideal circumstance like this, where you've got a small leak, you've got an evaporator coil that's been in service, this setup pulls down really, really quickly. It's gonna save you a lot of time and you're gonna know that you have a problem quicker, which is another big time-saving factor um, when you're working on these types of uh, systems is that when you're setting it up this way, is that you're going to know whether or not you have leaks or you have moisture sooner in the game, so you're not pulling on the thing for an hour before you realize that, oh, crap, the thing's, you know, moisture contaminated or we've got an issue. And again, if we had that micron gauge on the suction line, there'd be a significant difference in that measurement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If I took this right now, and actually, let's do that. So we'll move it from here. Because there's not going to be a significant pressure drop across these nice big hoses, the pressure drop is through that entire coil and everything else. So you can see, we're already here, we're below 500. We're at 300 microns here. And I think it was 600 on the other side yeah. before you moved. And this is having a hard time depressing the core on this, which is why it's acting weird. But, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's significantly different here than it was down on the other side. So now, once we're ready to do our decay test, if we were doing it with two hoses, we would just valve it off here, and we would watch our decay test at this point. And now we can really see that it's jumping up quickly, but that's because we're measuring on the pump side. As long as you have flow in the pump, it's going to drive down your uh, vacuum. It's going to show a deeper vacuum. As soon as you valve it off, that's when you really see what your vacuum truly is. That's where the rubber needs to rub. So there we have it. Let's, uh, let's, let's shut this thing off so it's not making a bunch of noise. Any uh, any other questions from the uh, from the audience, Austin? Uh, nope. All right. So uh, thanks for watching. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sal to cover some of the some of the details. Yeah. So thanks guys for watching. And again, this is sponsored by Johnstone Wear Group Accu Tools, um, and they are offering for Johnstone Wear Group locations for any of the uh, True Blue Accu Tools products um, on the shelves. They're going to be offering a 15% discount through the end of the month. That code for you to get that discount is ACCU15. Um, and if anybody has any questions, just email me at sal at productsbypros.com, and I can get you the details on that discount if you're having any trouble with your uh, branch that you buy from. Ace, say that again. ACCU15. ACCU15, so ACU15. Yep. Sal at Products by Pros. Yep. Um, yeah, big thanks to AccuTools. Thanks to Jim for the presentation. Um, thanks to Johnstone. I, I have to say, Johnstone Wear Group has been an excellent partner with me in business for many, many years. I'm very thankful to them for um, supporting this sort of training. Um, we're going to do more of this online. We're going to get better at it as we go because it's a lot easier for you guys to do it from the comfort of wherever you are versus having to uh, always make it into in-person trainings. And if you have any feedback for us of how we can make it better, any comments or questions, you can email sal at productsbypros.com or me. 
I'm Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at HVACRschool.com. Brian at HVACRschool.com. So. Cool. Thank right. you. Yeah, thank you so much. And also, I want to mention, uh, Jim also did this entire presentation on video if you go to the AccuTools YouTube channel. So if you want to see maybe the more, uh, more science-y version, um, you can go to the AccuTools YouTube channel. It's a great and check this video. Yeah, it really is. Great presentation. Oh, I, thought, I thought mine was pretty good, too. It, yours is awesome, was but okay? I, actually, I mean, actually learned everything prior okay, to coming here right, right, from that presentation. <laughs> fair enough. Um, yeah, so uh, final note, um, you can look up all these AccuTools products by going to the AccuTools website, all the different kits and hoses. I didn't, this, this presentation was a training, not right. about the particular products. Um, so if you want to find out more, I would suggest going to our website or their YouTube channel. All right. Thanks, y'all, for watching.